Alrighty, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to welcome all of you to 412 Church midweek service, and I also want to welcome all those that are watching. It's wonderful to have see so many smiling faces here tonight. So let's begin opening with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the time that we can spend in your word and also have fellowship together around it. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to continue our series on the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And remember that minor prophets are known for their smaller books. However, their books are just as important as the other prophets with larger books. This is going to be the last one of our series of the minor prophets. Next week, we're going to be into something completely different. It will be in the word of God, but it won't be about the prophets. So tonight we're going to study the minor prophet Nahum. And I've titled tonight's message, God's Vengeance. God's Vengeance. However, I could have really titled this message as an update on Nineveh because we're going to be talking about that quite a bit tonight. So let's take a look at some background before we begin, okay? And just as we found in the book of uh, Jonah in our study, uh, you may remember that Assyria was the most powerful nation on earth. And then it was a very proud nation, and it was proud of its self-sufficiency and its military might. It was a very strong and very powerful country. And now what we're going to find tonight is that once again, uh, uh, Syria has become wicked. It's become back to being cruel and brutal. Uh, they're oppressing the people. They're even slaughtering all those that the enemies that they are conquering. And what we're going to do is we're going to find out also in tonight's study. Uh, remember back when we were in, in Jonah and we're now fast forwarding about 120 years plus or minus a few years uh, where remember Jonah had went to the city of Nineveh. He had uh, opened up, he had started in the streets of preaching, and we learned that Jonah had given a nine-word message saying, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was his entire message, and what had happened? What did we learn? That the entire city, the entire nation had turned to God. And lo and behold, the people had turned from their evil ways. However, generation later, Evil has once again raised its ugly head, and God is using Nahum to pronounce judgment upon this evil nation. It's turned back being evil. So now with this judgment upon Assyria and the capital city of Nineveh, we learn a lesson from God that he will judge a sinful world, including nations. He will. He, not only does he do individually, but he does nations also. You see, disobedience, rebellion, and injustice will not prevail. It will happen, and it will happen longer than what we like, but it will not prevail. It will be punished, and it will be punished severely by a righteous and a holy God. And we can really count on that because our God rules the earth. He rules the earth. You know, when I say that and we think about it and we look at some of the things that are happening today and we say, well, I don't know if that's really happening. Well, let's go back in some history. What about Noah's flood? God had had enough. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? God had had enough. He had taken care of it. So don't think that he can't do it again because he can and he will. He's got a great track record for doing what he says he will do. So believe it. So... Open up your Bibles to Nahum. It's between Habakkuk and Micah. And I'm going to read the very first verse to you, and then we're going to take a look at that before we move on. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, The burden against Nineveh, the book of vision of Nahum, uh, Nahum and Echelshite. All right, that's it. That's all it is in the first verse. And what we find here in chapter 1, we're going to find a description of number one of three descriptions in the three chapters of Nahum. The first description we're going to find is the prediction of Nineveh's fall. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And just like the other minor prophets, we don't really know very much about Nahum. But here's what we do know. 
Uh, we know this, that his name, Nahum, means comfort. And he was a prophet to Judea. But he focuses entirely on Syria and the city of Nineveh in his book. And we know that his home is Echoshite. Now, Echoshite is a town in southwest Judea. Now, just kind of a heads up here, if you're thinking that Nahum's name, meaning comfort, doesn't match up with this prophecy, you'd be wrong. And here's the reason why. You see, his message to Nineveh brings judgment from God, not much comfort there, and that surely isn't going to be very comforting at all. However, his message will bring comfort to the people of God, who God is most concerned about. Remember way back in Genesis chapter 3, he's talking about is, uh, God has Moses write about Israel, where he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And it, it still is true today. Still true today. And then that brings us to the purpose of Nam's prophecy. You see, those that punish God's people will one day be judged themselves. And all I got to say is wake up America. Because yeah. we're no better. We're no better. The book of Nam has three chapters, and each chapter has its own description of Nam's message here. And in chapter one, it gives us nine facts concerning God's vengeance. So let's take a look at verses two through seven. Follow along with me as I read those verses. Verse 2, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the, acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in a whirlwind and in a storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yet the world and all who dwell in it, who can stand before his indignation and who can endure fierceness and his anger, his fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows who and he knows who trusts in him. Wow. A lot going on there. A lot going on, but we're going to be able to get through that all tonight. And like I say, we see here in the first, very first description of Nahum's book here is a prediction of uh, Nineveh's fall. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in these six verses that we just read, we're going to find the very first five facts of God's vengeance towards Nineveh. In verse 2, it gives us the first and the second facts of the Lord's vengeance. One it will be against all who rebel and oppose him. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he will have wrath for his enemies. That's what it says. He will do it. And then in verse 2, we also find something that God calls a sin for us, and that is God is jealous. God is jealous, it says. So why is it a sin for us? Well, let me explain God alone has the right to be jealous and to carry out his vengeance. And yes, jealousy and vengeance may be a surprising words to you and I to associate with God, but we can because of this. But we all know that when we are jealous and we take out our vengeance, we're doing it in a spirit of selfishness. We don't have the right spirit when we do that. God's jealousy, see, is righteous and our jealousy is not. There's a difference between righteous jealousy and spiritual jealousy that is bad. And that's what we have. However, it's totally appropriate also for God to insist on our complete allegiance. And it's just for him to punish, very just for him, because he is a just and fair God, for him to punish unrepentant evildoers. Otherwise, if he didn't, there'd be no consequences to sin. And we can't have that. It's just like children. We're nothing more than children to God, just as our children and our grandchildren are our children. If there's no consequences to what they may do, be doing wrong, then what are they doing? They just keep on doing it. So this is why there has to be consequences. The bottom line is God's purpose is to remove sin and restore peace to the world. 
And we're going to see that over in verse 15 when we get there. In verse 3, we find the Lord's third fact of vengeance. It says this, the Lord is slow to anger to take revenge. But when he is ready to punish, he will find and we will find that even the mountains will tremble. So in other words, when he comes down, he comes down with fire. He comes down hard. Yes, God is slow to anger. Why? Because he gives his true followers time to share his love and truth with the unsaved. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he was long suffering with me. He waited for a long time. And I'm glad for that. But don't be fooled. God's judgment will come. You see, God will not allow sin to go unchecked forever. The Lord is not hasty. In other words, he's not quick. He gives time for people to repent of their ways. Now, I'm going to bring up something that probably we've all thought about at least once or maybe probably twice, maybe more times than that. I believe that we've all thought and we've asked a question to ourselves. Why hasn't God punished uh, so-and-so's evil ways? Right? We've all seen somebody doing evil. And we're wondering, God, where are you? Why haven't you done something about that? About something they have or they are doing? As a matter of fact, I have even heard the word use this when somebody is talking to me about it. They'll say karma. You ever hear that? Yeah. yeah. Or how about the phrase, what goes around comes around? Yeah. But here's the deal. What we do, need to do is this. We need to remember that if God punished evil immediately by giving us what we really deserved, we'd still be lost and we'd be certain for death. So I'm thankful that he's long suffering. I'm thankful that he's not hasty. I'm thankful that he waits. I really, truly am. And just because we see somebody else getting away with something doesn't mean that God's not going to take care of it because he will. He will take care of it. In Romans, matter of fact, in, and, and the way I know this is over in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul tells us that for the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. Exactly. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So that's what we need to really hold on to. In other words, we're free to choose between two masters, God or sin. <coughs> but the one thing that we're not free to choose is the consequence. That's all left up to God. God chooses the consequence for each and every one of us. Each of the masters pay with their own cur currency, a matter of fact. The currency of sin is eternal death. And Jesus' cur currency is eternal life. Really, it's our choice. That's what it all boils down to, is our choice. So we should be thankful that God is slow to anger because he gives people like you and me a time in our lives to turn to him. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm praising the Lord for it. I really, truly am. We also find in verses 3 and 4 this, that the Lord has great power and has quite a stockpile of weapons. The Lord is able to dry the seas and the rivers. He just does it, just dries them up. I mean, not even to mud, I mean to dust. And the Lord is in charge of whirlwinds, and the clouds are no more than dust of his feet. And Nahum even mentions that the areas of Bashan and Carmel over in verse 4. Why does he mention that? Why is that important? Well, it's really important because those are very fertile areas of the day. Very fertile of, of Nahum's day. And the Lord, the point that he's making is this, that there's nothing he can't do that he can even make the flowers wilt in a very flourishing area. In verse 6, we find the Lord's fourth fact of God's vengeance. The Lord will not let the guilty go unpunished. Makes it clear. In verse 6, we find two questions being asked. Who can cast or who can stand before his ignination? Ignination is righteous anger. And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? Two very important questions. In other words here, that no, it's no person on earth can safely defy God, the Almighty and the creator of all the universe. You can't defy him. You can run from him. You can try to hide from him, but he knows exactly where you are. Adam and Eve tried it. He knew where they were. He knows where you and I are. We're, we can't hide it. There's nothing. There's no place dark enough where he can't see us. Nothing. Nowhere. It's not going to happen. So, that is very important for us to remember when we are being tempted. 
and we think, oh, I can get away with this. Nobody's watching. Nobody's here. Yeah. Not at all. This is a God who controls the sun, the galaxies, and the vast stretches beyond, and also who controls the rise and fall of nations. Remember? We talked about this not too long ago over in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. It says, He being God removes kings and raises up kings. Wow. Now we may not agree with the kings that He raises up and takes down, <laughs> but He's got His reason. And he's got his purposes. You can bet on that. He does. He does. There's a reason for everything. He knows. He's got good purposes. So how could a kingdom even as powerful as Assyria challenge God's awesome power? It really can't. But because of their pride, they're going to try. But really it's going to be too bad for Syria because even though they were warned, they could not look into the future and actually see actually see the ruins that their country would become. Again, I say, wake up, America. Don't defy God. Let's not make the same mistake that Syria has made. God will be here forever with greater power than that of all the armies and nations combined. This whole world could go against God, and it's, it's looking like it's turning that way now. But believe me, I know who wins. I've read the end of the book. Amen. We win. God wins. He's, you know, he's, there, he's the one that's leading us. So even the, if the whole world goes against him, we've got it made. We've got it made. We may have some waves, but we've got it made. In verse 7, we also find the Lord's fifth fact of God's vengeance. The Lord is good and, and will be refuge to all who truly trust in Him in the coming day of vengeance. The Lord is good. I heard all the time. And those of us that truly trust Him have Him for our refuge. I want to take a moment and, talk out and, and point out a phrase in verse 7 that I think that each and every one of you should take out your Bible, highlight it, mark it, underline it, put it out to the edge, and really believe it, okay? It is this, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Now, I don't know about you, but I still have, I have days of trouble. Does anybody else or is it just me? <laughs> oh, that makes me feel very good. If I was the only one, I'd be thinking about therapy. <laughs> but no, when we have those troubled days, we need to, we need to reflect back at where our stronghold really is. And it's in God Almighty. It's in God Almighty. We need to believe that. You know, that's a promise. That's another one of those 7,000 promises that we find in the Bible from God to each and every one of us. When we need to believe it because it's true. God is saying this, I am the one to run to. Not to run away from, but to run to. He's a safety belt. He's the, the shoulder strap. He's saying, I am the one who offers security. He is our security. And lastly, he says, I'm the one that is strong. And that's what we have to believe. He's the strong one. He's the strong man. Follow along as I read verses 8 through 15. Verses 8 through 15 say this, But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place. And darkness will pursue his enemies. Uh, what do you conspire against the Lord? Uh, he will make you utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up for a second time. For while tangled like thorns and like drunken drunkards, they shall be devoured like the stubble fully dried. From you comes one forth who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. And, the, and says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command uh, concerning you. Your name shall be 
perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the, cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave for you are vile. Behold the mountains, the feet of him who bring good tidings, who proclaims peace. O oh, Judea, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows for the wicked one shall no more pass through. He is utterly cut off. Man, a lot going on in there. And in those verses, what we're going to do is we're going to find the final four facts of God's vengeance. In verses 8 through 12, we find the Lord's sixth fact of God's vengeance. And this is what it is. In verses 5, we find, in these five verses, we find the Lord will unleash his vengeance like an overwhelming flood and put an end to Nineveh and all others who rebel against him. That's what he's going to do. But to all those who love the Lord, his mercy is a stronghold. Supplying all their needs. However, to the Lord's enemy, he is an overflowing flood that will sweep them away. In verse 11, we find a wicked counselor who plots evil against the Lord. That wicked counselor may have been the king of Assyria at the time, and he was the king that brought, Nineveh, uh, brought Assyria to the highest point of their power. He was the one that made them so strong against other nations around him. In verses 12 and 13, we find the Lord's seventh act of God's vision. The Lord will execute vengeance to deliver his people from God's discipline. Okay. Now, through his prophet here, Nahum, the Lord has promised to remove his hand of discipline from Judea. You see, what's really happening here? Judea has been persecuted. They have been beat up. They have been conquered. They have been absolutely persecuted to the end. God has had enough of that. So, again, we know that God raises up kings, takes kings down. He's about to bring up a king when we get into uh, the second chapter. So, we find here that through his prophet, he's promised to remove this discipline from Judea. And God would deliver the Israelites from all of their affliction and all of their suffering. And he himself would break the yoke of their necks and tear or burst their bonds or shackles away. And in verse 14, we find the Lord's eighth, number eight fact of God's vengeance. And that being this, the Lord will execute vengeance to remove all unbelievers. That's going to happen too. Uh, here in no uncertain terms, the Lord makes it perfectly clear that the Assyrians would have no descendants to bear their name. That's pretty final. And the Lord absolutely does it. He, the Lord makes a final that is saying that the nation would be destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth. You know that we know that prophecy has been fulfilled? We know it. The ruins of Nineveh have been dug up and they've been identified in 1845. So roughly for 20, some 2,400 years, it was absolutely wiped off the face of the earth, just as Nahum has prophesied. And in verse 15, we find the Lord's ninth and final fact of God's vengeance. The Lord will execute vengeance to bring peace and freedom to worship to his people. Wow, that's great. I'm excited for that. The picture that uh, verse 15 paints is this, that a messenger uh, races over the hills, uh, carrying the good news that the enemy of Syria has been destroyed. It's going to Judea to, to tell them. So peace would, could now sweep across the country and the true believers could celebrate and fulfill their vows. Vows, remember, we know is promises before the Lord. Uh, God's prophet, prophet also, uh, he, he predicted this day would come when the wicked would no longer oppress or persecute God's people. The fall of Nineveh happened in 612 B.C. And I'll say it again, the purpose of the book of Nahum was not only to warn Nineveh, the purpose was to encourage Judea and give them hope. That's what we have too, we have hope. We have hope of God. How did he do it? Well, by telling them to keep their, their feasts and perform your vows, the wicked one would be utterly cut off. When God tells you that, believe him. This is not some story that he's telling you. It's the truth. And in chapter one, we looked at the very first description of the fall of Nineveh being the prediction. That is all the prediction. And now we're going to study the second description of the fall of Nineveh, a picture of God's coming judgment. And that's found in chapter two. In chapter two, it gives us a picture of the events of 612 BC, 
when the Babylonians and the Medes formed a coalition. In other words, they came together as one body. They came together as a coalition to conquer Nineveh and to destroy the Assyrian Empire. This is the way God is getting back at the Assyrians by bringing the Babylonians together along with the Medes to form this, co uh, this uh, coalition to work together to battle them and to conquer them. And we all know this, that one of the most fund uh, fundamental principles in all of life is we reap what we sow, right? Of course it is. Well, Syria is no different. And for over a century, these cruel people had wreaked havoc and buta uh, brutality, attacking uh, nation after nation, stealing their wealth and enslaving the survivors. And now it's time for God's judgment to fall on this vicious people. So move on over to chapter two. Follow along as I read the very first six verses. Verse one of chapter two says this. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily for the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel for the emptiers have emptied themselves out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The violent men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaring, uh, flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste in her walls. The, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened. Okay, we're going to go back and see what all that really is meaning, okay? Wow, man, let me tell you, uh, this sounds like a, a pretty bloody, deadly uh, battle, doesn't it? Um, in my, in, as, I, as I'm reading verse 1, there, I, I just see in my mind's eye officers screaming out all these orders. What were they? Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your, your power mightily. You can just hear them, hear them screaming that out. And these verses describe God's pronouncement through Nahum of a different future battle where Nineveh will be completely destroyed. In verse 2, Nahum is saying that the nation of Israel and the promised land will be restored and elevated and exalted to a position of power and honor. And this prophecy will completely be fulfilled when Jesus returns to set up God's kingdom here on earth. Remember the millennial kingdom? God's going to rule this earth. Jesus is coming, let me tell you. He's coming. He's going to set up power right in the middle of Jerusalem. In verses 3 and 6, Nahum gives us a graphic description of God's coming judgment. What is it? He's saying this. When the Babylonians attack, their shields are going to be made red. And the men are in scarlet uniforms. Uh, this is what Nahum predicted hundreds of years before. And their chariots would storm through the streets as swift as lightning, glowing like flaming torches. Let me tell you, this is going to be a hideous sight. It's going to scare these people to death when these Babylonians and Medes come through. And even though the Assyrian king would have some of his troops to withstand the onslaught of the enemy, the soldiers, it says in Scripture, that they're going to stumble as they run for safety to their walls. They're going to be stumbling and falling all over themselves. Why? Because it, of terror. They're scared to death. In verse 6 is where we find the decisive turning point. It is when the invading army captures the river gates that control the flow of water, both inside and outside the city. Now everybody's saying, oh, they cut off their water supply. Oh no, they did the opposite. They opened it up. You see, the Tigris River flowed close to the walls of the city, and two large streams flowed through the city back into the Tigris River. So the Babylonian army, what they did was this. They released a flow of water in order to undermine the walls of the city, and the strategy was so, accept, uh, so successful that it, even the king's palace within the city walls collapsed. They didn't cut it off. They weren't going to thirst them to death. They just flooded it. So what are the lessons from the verses that you and I can apply to our lives? Well, there's at least two. Number one, the first one I wrote down was this. God's future judgment is assured because God himself guarantees that he will judge the world. You know, I'm pretty happy that God's going to be the one judging the world. I don't want any man that I know here on earth doing it. Because at least I know God 
is fair and he's just. I know that. Number two, the Lord warns us to prepare for the coming judgment. We have a warning. You know, God just doesn't do anything like that. He doesn't pass judgment as a surprise. He gives us all warning. Remember he sent Jonah? Yeah, he prepares us. We have the word of God. The word of God prepares you and I for the coming judgment. You see, today we've been warned of God's coming judgment. It will happen. You see, we can either prepare by repenting for our sins and becoming acceptable to the Lord, or else we can face the terrifying judgment of the Lord. I don't know which one you choose, but I know which one I want. So yes, this repentance does apply to each and every one of us individually. However, it also applies to nations, as we've seen. Wake up, America. Wake up. You see, I believe this with all my heart, that today is a day of calling for national and individual repentance, because I believe it's urgently needed today. I'm telling you, it is. It absolutely is. In verse 7, we find the survivors of the attack would be enslaved and exiled. Uh, they would suffer terribly and, the, and uh, terribly, just as the woman would moan as doves beating their chest in deep sorrow and anguish. In verse 8, we find the defenders of the city would flee for their lives. Like water rushing through a broken dam, the defenders would desert their post. It's like, I'm getting out of here, running away. They're tucking tail and turning and running. Running away. In verse 9, we find the people's wealth and the valuables would be plundered and the land would be stripped bare. And in verse 10, we find the people of Nineveh faces, their faces absolutely drained of color, white as a sheet, drained of all color, with buckling knees and hearts that melt because of their pain and suffering. Let me tell you, God's vengeance is not something for the weak. In verses 11 and 12, we see the word lion. Lion in, is mentioned five times. And the word lion here is alluding to Assyria. Why? Because Assyria had adopted the lion as their symbol for their nation. Just like America has the eagle, theirs was the lion. In verse 13 says, Behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, the Lord is saying that he has both the authority and the power to stand against all who oppose him. He does. He does. Does it break his heart about people who oppose him? Of course it does. He wants to have everyone to have eternal life. But it's not going to happen, is it? We know which is the broad way and which is the narrow way, don't we? But he does want it. He does want it. But he knows that it's just not going to happen. Our lesson so far, really, so far in what we've read and what we've learned is God has given the people of Nineveh a chance to repent, which they did after receiving the message from Jonah. However, what happened? They returned to their sin and its consequences were and ended up being destroying them. They were doing fine right after Jonah, when Jonah was there. And I don't know exactly for how long after Jonah left, but then woo, they fell off the edge. Anybody else ever jumped the tracks? After you were on the tracks? <laughs> Another reason why I'm glad it's just not me. <laughs> but you see, they weren't coming back. God knew they weren't coming back. All the way, all the time. All the time. So the, really the bottom line here is this, the point for the people, cities, and nations after which there were no turning back. So yes, God is long-suffering. However, even God has a point of no return where he says, enough is enough. We all said that to our kids. Well, God's doing the very same thing. Let's move on over to chapter 3 where we find the third description of the fall of Nineveh. Third description is this, the reasons why Nineveh fell. And in these verses, the prophet Nahum warned the rulers and the citizens of Nineveh that they were doomed. They were doomed. Verse 1 starts off using the word, whoa. That's an attention getter. It means trouble is coming, and it's, and it's God's terrifying judgment. Man, when you see the word, whoa, W-O-E, 
better stand up, take notice, because it, it's there for a reason. In verses 2 and 3, it paints us a picture of the chaos that would sweep through the streets of Nineveh. Now just imagine what we see there in those verses. It's, think of this, the sound of the whips of the horses and the rattling of the chariot wheels and the dust and the dirt flying through the air with all the hoofbeats from all the horses. Oh yeah, it, that verse also ends with dead bodies scattered all over. Dead bodies all over the land, scattered. You know, it's been said that God's judgments echoed the sound of the hoofbeats, but God's love quietly convicts. And it does. Amen. God's love quietly convicts us. Uh, verses 1 through 3 tell us that Nive Nivea fe uh, fell because of the bloodshed, lies, and ro robbery. In verse 4, we find four, uh, more reasons why Nineveh fell. It was because of lust, idolatry, sorcery, and witchcraft. And the Bible says this, prostitution, holotry, and adultery refer to both acts, not only of illicit sex and a spiritual adultery, which the citizens of Nineveh were guilty of committing both. Both. Sexual sins, physical sexual sins, and also spiritual sexual sins. In verse 5, we see the phrase uh, repeated from uh, chapter 2, verse 13, and it is this, Behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. Now we know that God is a holy God, and here God feels that He should reemphasize His holiness to us. Sometimes, don't we forget sometimes? Yeah, yeah we do. We put it, don't we put Him on the back burner every once in a while? Especially when things are going great, right? Well, somehow or another, I don't know about you, but God's got a way of snapping us back into reality, doesn't He? Yeah, he does. He certainly does. And this is what's happening here. He's reemphasizing his holiness. In verses 8 through 15, we find that Nineveh fell because of pride. And what was her pride? Well, they thought that they were better and they were stronger than the countries around them. They had pride. They were overconfident. They thought they had the world by the tail. But they didn't. They didn't count on God. You see, Assyria considered herself stronger, greater, and above all the other nations and people. Consequently, what Assyria sowed, she would reap. Wake up. In verses 16 through 19, we find the fourth and, we find, and the final reason Nineveh fell. It was because of her covetousness, excess, and complacency. Take a look at verse 18. Let me read it. This is an important verse. Verse 18 in chapter 3, it says this. Your shepherds slumber. O king of Assyria, your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. In other words, it's just, you know, everybody just do what you want to do. Everything's fine. You know, no big deal. No big deal. Not at all. Covetousness, excess and complacency. Uh, these are sins that help destroy uh, uh, Assyria from within itself. Yes, the attack against Nineveh would come from within the city walls. The Assyrians would collapse due to what they had taken place in their hearts, though. It was because of their hearts they collapsed. It really wasn't anything else. It was their hearts. It was the people's covetousness and the extravagance that led to selfishness, hoarding, discrimination, uh, the deep-seated tension between the wealthy and the poor. In addition, the wealthy politicians, business leaders, landowners, and nobles had all become complacent and lethargic to the point that there was no will within the people to stay alert. Why does this happen? Well, it happens to a people who become dependent on the government, and that's exactly what happened here. In other words, entitlements. People that come completely dependent. Any of this sound familiar, America? Yeah. Wake up, America. Wake up. Yeah. Question. Could America today be the modern day of Syria? Amen. Do we fit the example of Nineveh with bloodshed, lies, robbery, harlotries, sorceries, pride, covetousness, excess, and complacency? Yeah. You decide. You decide. So really here, the great theme of Nahum is at last God's vindicated is of his righteousness. He's got righteousness and exercised his vengeance upon a wicked nation. And believe me, he's not done. He's not done. These are all examples for you and I today. 
but we have a great God. Amen? Amen. Yes, we do. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word here, Lord. We thank you for your warnings as we have been going through these minor prophets, God. How wonderful it is to be able to be warned and to know and to be able for each and every one of us to see the wrong that we may be doing, not only as an individual or as a person or a people, but the wrong of nations within this world that you have created. Lord, I truly do believe that you are the stronghold in the day of trouble. Lord, I, I pray that each and every one of us will, will remember that when those days come upon us, or even small things to big things, Lord, that you are the stronghold. I think of our nation, Lord. But Lord, once again, you give us a promise. You give us a promise. I think of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and to pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from them in heaven and, I and forgive them of their sins and heal their land. Lord, right now, I, I pray for our nation. I pray for our nation's leaders, Lord. I pray for their salvation because only you can turn them to the way. Lord, we have no control. We have no power over them. But Lord, you do. And I pray for their salvation, not only to, to help us as, as, a, as a person or even help us as a nation, Lord, that they would be able to spend eternity with you, Lord. Lord, because I know that that's what you want. So I pray for their salvation, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they, you would somehow or another convict their hearts to do your will instead of their prideful will. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for all the blessings. Lord, continue to bless us, not only as a people, but also as a nation, Lord. Show us the way that we should go. Give us your will. Give us your guidance, your direction, your wisdom, Lord. And we'll thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.